Hello friends this is Fox Nival Studios today we are here with new chapter what if Naruto was on Avatar The Last Airbender. Guys before starting story please subscribe our channel. Now let's begin the story fire bent from his fingertips where there used to be hand seals. His kata forms pristine, perfect, and flawless. The speed of his kicks and punches created surging fire. The training room lit ablaze with sheer terror and pride. Landing with grace and bowing to the prince, he was met with silence from the man he called, father. To call him a father is quite a stretch as he never was there for him and Azula. He is only present during his advanced firebending lessons that his father provides to them and during dinner. Otherwise, he is in his private chambers. His father Ozai always wore an indifferent expression whenever he trained and only ever praised him to advance his own personal goal. To him, this is only done to impress his father and nothing more. He does get some tips and a few tricks for a new form of fighting, but he quickly got adept at firebending, even from a young age. Fire is innate to the blood of an Uchiha, and he gained further understanding of fire from it. From his nightly readings, he found that this world is very different from the world that he once lived in. In this world, people bend physical elements instead of chakra manifestation. Although, his own world doesn't revolve around that. He could still remember the gentle smile that his mother, Ursa, wore as he was introduced into this new world. Ozai, although somewhat apathetic to him, still wore a smile as he learned that his son is a firebender and a prodigy at that. Despite this, his father is practically the same as the one from his past life, he is reserved. Ozai nodded at his performance. You have excelled from my expectations. Your day is free, Zuko. You are free to do as you please. I will father. He bowed as Ozai left his personal training room. He could tell that if his skills in firebending were ever inadequate, the privileges he gained from his father would wither. His training with Piandao would be greatly diminished and his nighttime privacy would be replaced with more hours in firebending training. He trailed through the palace where he was met with smiles from the guards and servants as the sun sets from the west. In turn, he nodded and smiled slightly as he went to his chambers to freshen up and change clothes. The clothes he wore here are a far cry from the comfortable, but effective clothes given to him by the Anbu and Akatsuki. Despite this, his clothes were adequate enough for him and he did not complain even with his privileges as the son of a prince. He examined himself in his own mirror. Instead of his signature hairstyle of a single low ponytail and center parted bangs, all of his hair is placed in a single high ponytail. Supposedly, this symbolizes his nobility and stature, but to him, it's just all too much. He already has things that no commoner in the realm would ever have, and now their hair has to be high, just to make a clear message even more clear, the prominent tear troughs that helped him in his intimidation, as well as distinguishing him from Sasuke is replaced by a smooth face appropriate for a noble. However, there is one thing that his new life hasn't replaced in terms of appearance. He turned his fire-like gold eyes into the red pinwheel one that he is so accustomed to, the Mangekyo Sharingan. Upon activating the Dojutsu, he felt his energy draining faster than it should. With a blink of his eyes, he turned it back into his, now normal gold eyes. As he is finishing tidying up, he can hear running from the halls of the palace and it is heading straight for his room. When the doors were opened, he was already finished, so he did not resist being tackled to the ground by a known assailant. Zuzu. You won't guess what happened. Azula, his little sister, wore a giant smile that swelled his heart. She shuffled to get something from her pocket and showed him a paper, I aced the exams, ha, huh? just like you did. He chuckled and poked her forehead, ow. What was that for? Azula demanded but he just shuffled her hair. I always knew you could do it, Azula. You should show it to mother and father, they will be proud too. HMPF. Azula huffed, you always know everything, don't you? He can already see the hint of a smirk that Azula tried to hide, so he tickled her. He cherished his moments with Azula, his new sibling in this new world. He tries to be the best big brother that he can be to her, but still, there is a hint of melancholy in spending time with her. He did the same things with Sasuke, but his time with him was literally cut short. Zuzu stop it. Azula laughed as he continued to tickle her until he came to an abrupt stop. Bad Zuzu. Azula smirked again saying, now that I aced the test, you have to teach me what father is teaching you. You promised you would. Of course, he smiled. If you have free time tomorrow, see me, okay, Zula. Now. Do you remember what we talked about, with the servants? 
Yes, Azula trailed as she rolled her eyes. Be kind to them blah, blah, blah. I mean why do we need to be kind to them anyway? They're peasants. Azula. Remember what I said about the ship? If you are the captain and just make everyone's life miserable, they will eventually commit mutiny. To rule with fear is to invite insurrection within your ranks. However, if you are kind to them and show them respect, they will do so in return. All right, all right. Azula's shoulders resigned. To be honest, you sound like uncle or even grandfather. If I were grandfather, I would immediately appoint you as crown prince and ditch that tea lover. You'd be a great fire lord. He then gave a quick smile. That Azula? That is one thing that I don't know. Why not? You're a genius. Father and mother both adore you. The palace loves you. Even those generals try to woo you just to gain an insight into the war. Azula exclaimed loudly as she relaxed on his shoulders. Some, but not all. Most of them just want to introduce their daughters to me. As if I have interest in them, he chuckled. Uncle will one day be a great fire lord, I'm sure of it. His uncle was a kind man to him and taught him some advanced firebending techniques, one of which can redirect lightning. Although, he was surprised to be able to do such a thing since it was not his keke jenke. Nevertheless, he welcomed its addition to his arsenal. That tea lover. U-G-H-H, -H, Azula slouched, I wonder what's happening in Ba Sing Se right now. At that, he hardened his eyes, but Azula barely noticed. With that, he stood up and carried his sister. Do you want to play hide and seek? Dinner will be in about an hour after all, and I have nothing to do. Azula quickly shook her head. No, you always know where I am, and when you hide I can't find you. You always win, it's not fair. He thought for a moment, hum how about this then? If you can find me, I'll teach you a firebending technique even father doesn't know. I don't know, it's kind of hard to believe father doesn't know a technique that you know, Azula said, trailing off, but he still didn't back down. Are you sure? You don't want to learn the phoenix style? What's that? Azula asks. Something that I invented, he said as he gave her a smirk. He can see that she still wasn't convinced. Placing her on the bed, he set his foot firmly on the middle of the room. No keta is formed, but he lets his kai flow from his body. From his place on the floor, he jumped up high and began to create a barrage of hot spitting fire in very quick succession using his fists and foot. This firebending form is similar to the katan, hosenka no jutsu, fire release, phoenix sage fire technique, with spitting fire. However, he tried to emulate it with just sheer firebending and the results were from days of practice. Not as energy efficient as ninjutsu, and he cannot control the trajectory of the flames as soon as it leaves his fists and feet. Still, he has yet to reveal his abilities from his past life to anyone, not even Azula. If he does, they might just accuse him of being the Avatar. As he landed to the ground he quickly extinguished the flames that he caused. He expects that Azula will have a slack-jawed face to the ground, and he was right. You have to teach me that, Azula shouted, but she was met with his finger on her lips. I will, but only if you beat me at hind and seek, remember. Therefore, if you want to beat me, you'll actually have to play hide and seek with me, he said, smiling, I'm also going to give you another leeway. The only floor that I can hide on is this floor. If I hide on any other floor, I automatically lose. Now, if you cannot find me within 10 minutes, you lose, he said, about to go. But he turned his head on her, also, no firebending. Fiani, Azula trailed off, and as soon as she turned her back, her brother was gone. Zuzu here I come. Itachi, now Zuko, is a master of stealth. From his days in the Anbu and his time in the Akatsuki, he can infiltrate and do stealth missions with relative ease. Now, with Zuko's body, he hid in the shadows. He still remembered how he spent his time when he was in the Hidden Leaf. Almost all the free time that he had, he gave it to Sasuke. However, his last days there were mostly trying to prevent the Uchiha clan uprising. Now? He is trying to spend his free time with his new family. Even though his schedule is almost always busy, he still manages to spend time with Azula every now and then. He already noticed how their mother is quite distant towards her and how Ozai sows the seeds of cruelty in her. Ozai seeing that he couldn't be converted to his creed. Ergo, he makes sure he is there to support her and give her the balance she needs because of how their parents treat her. Giving support and imbuing kindness to her. Almost becoming a third parent to her. From his experience, Azula is a great hide-and-seek player, when he is not involved. When Azula plays with other kids, she always wins. 
though, he could see those who play with her are just letting her win out of fear. Leaving her all alone, not even daring to even get close to her. Now, most of the time, she plays alone or with him. Azula is great at hiding things, especially her sorrow. To keep her from her sorrow, her big brother is there and always has time to spare for her, like now. Itachi doesn't want Azula to think that there isn't someone in her life that truly loved her, bearing no fear or aggression towards her. Itachi can already see the contempt brewing in her heart and he knows where that can lead to. Sasuke is a testament to that. He indulges her competitive heart with games like these, challenging her to become better. Hiding in one of the slightly stuffy closets in the supply room, he is covering his mouth to lessen the dust intake. His hiding place already works wonders, as five minutes pass and Itachi doesn't hear any footsteps coming to the room. Waiting here gave him ample time to prepare. Of course, he is not going to let Azula win as he has many tricks up his sleeves. Once footsteps were heard outside, he prepared for the inevitable. The door slammed open and he heard a grumbling Azula. Stupid Zuzu. Stupid hide and seek. Ah, uh, Itachi rattled in the closet just to provoke her, and Azula quickly opened the door, but instead of seeing him, what greeted her as, another log. She shouted as Itachi quickly fled the room, snickering to himself as he tried to find another hiding place. He knows she will want to burn the log, but he put in place a strict no firebending rule in this game, such cruelty. He wouldn't want this game to turn into search and destroy. This time, he hid near the top of the columns, hiding in the darkness. His gaze then went to Azula who was walking down the halls gazing up at the columns, but was still unable to spot him. Fidgeting in her place, he can tell that she's already tempted to use her firebending, just to light up the room. Her hunger for firebending was too much for her to handle and it's an endurance test for her not to use it. Azula visibly managed to rein herself in, resisting the urge to use her firebending. With a proud smile Itachi watched as Azula left the hallway without firebending a single flame. Landing on the ground, Itachi scanned the hallway, making sure the coast was clear. He quickly sets off to move close to Azula, as he finds the game the most interesting when the danger is near. Not even the servants could see Itachi with how quickly he moved. Often just thinking the wind or some spirits of dead airbenders passed by. When he catches up to her, she's fuming in anger trying really hard not to firebend away her problems. He hid under a table, deliberately making noise just in earshot of her. Itachi can already feel the footsteps coming in his direction and when the tables flipped, Azula found, a log. Again. She shouted. Why do I keep finding logs? Fire flared from her nostrils, and just like that, her control ran out. She threw a fist out of anger and was about to firebend. However, before she could do it, her hand was stopped by Itachi and he poked her forehead with two of his fingers. Your ten minutes are up. Looks like I won, again. Zuzu, you are cheating. Azula shouted as she pointed her finger to him. Every time I find you, it's always a log. You're cheating. Oh, the logs? Itachi smirked. Those are decoys. I know you're going to take the bait every time. That's still cheating, Zuzu. I never said anything about decoys, Azula. You can use decoys of your own too. That just makes hide and seek harder and far more interesting. He leaned on the wall next to a fuming Azula. And logs are pretty easy things to get. Yeah, but I didn't see a servant just dragging logs in here. Azula huffed, but still sat beside her brother. I wonder if you are just doing this just to make fun of me. I'm not, Itachi calmly said, but there's an edge to his voice. Sure hide and seek is fun, but if you analyze it enough, you can draw parallels to it. In this game, it is all about deceiving your opponent about your position. It's the same when you are fighting, it's about reading your opponent and predicting their moves, baiting them, then countering them. This is just a much more fun, light-hearted version of it. Yeah, a version for losers. Azula huffed again, turning her head away from Itachi. Oh don't be like that, Itachi knelt in front of her. He still could see that Azula was avoiding his eyes, but soon enough, her head slowly turned to him. You did well, even if you lost. Azula pouted, you're just saying that, so that I feel better. No, I'm not. Itachi gave her a genuine smile, you've really improved. Maybe one day, you'll be able to see through my decoys and I may have to teach you the phoenix style. You wanna learn it, right? Azula slowly nodded, see. I know that hide and seek isn't really your favorite, so how about we play pie show next time? You're good at it. This time, Azula gave a bright smile, deal. No cheating, though. I'm not cheating, Azula. 
Itachi gave a false grumble. Azula didn't listen though, speeding through the corridors away from him, shouting, Zuzu is a cheat. Itachi just gave a smile and moved on to his room, preparing for dinner. Dinner is uneventful, just the typical food and splendor of the palace presented to them. Even if Itachi has lived under his new name, Zuko, for 11 years now, there are things he is still getting used to. For example, how the writing system works here in this new world. It is pure kanji rather than a mix of hiragana and katakana. While he did adapt to it quite fast, there are some kanji that are different from this world's writing system but nevertheless, the speaking language stayed the same. Even in his death in that world, he loved two things, Konoha and his little brother Sasuke. For eleven years in his new life, he constantly thought about him. On what path he's on, now that Itachi showed him the truth of his shameful actions. Maybe he tried to destroy Konoha or perhaps he tried to get more answers. Just about anything that Itachi plans or tries to solve backfires. In the years of these constant pandering thoughts, he has come to two conclusions. He cannot return to his old life, nor does he want to. Even though his knowledge of ninjutsu is still intact, along with his chakra, he doesn't truly have a place in that world. Now, he is creating a new life in this new world, by learning from his past mistakes. Choosing to now be a better brother to his younger sibling, being there for them when they need him. However, even if he is now in another world, now that he is alone, he shifts his hair into the low ponytail he's used to. The style that he is most comfortable with. The candles gave his room light as he started reading a book about the various bending in the four nations. Currently, it's about earthbending. Accounts from various memoirs of past Fire Nation generals. Their experience in campaigning against the Earth Kingdom had gained them a remarkable amount of knowledge about earthbending. Itachi drowned himself in their words, fully immersed in his reading. From what Itachi read, earthbenders are rigid and headstrong, deriving their power from their wills. Unlike the use of other bending arts, earthbending is somewhat close to earth release, as it directly manipulates the earth. However, earthbenders can use the earth as projectiles, rather than just manipulating the terrain. Though it is uncommon, he knew there were cases of earth release being used as a projectile. Such as Doton, Dorio Dango, earth release, earth mausoleum dumpling, or any of Didara's techniques. Now, sandbending is a curious bending ability. He knows of the infamous Gara of the sand's abilities and how the hidden sand tried to destroy the hidden leaf. Itachi was also aware of Gara's help in trying to bring Sasuke back to the village after he left for Orochimaru. The strength Gara had was mainly due to his sand manipulation abilities. Sandbending seems to be very similar to sand manipulation, however, in his previous life, sand manipulation needed wind release and earth release to fully be able to use the ability. Unlike the ninja arts, Itachi concludes from his readings that while bending in itself is fairly straightforward with many sub-disciplines such as healing in waterbenders, sandbending, and lava bending in earthbenders, lightning generation in firebenders, customization is still far superior in nature transformation. Heck, he hasn't even heard of anyone, not even the avatar, being able to manipulate wood, but Tenzo and Hashirama had the ability to do it. A slight breeze blew through his room with the opening of his door. It was his mother, Ursa walking in through the door with a tray in hand. On the tray was a single teacup and some rice cakes. Here's your nightly tea. Zuko. His mother kindly said to him, laying down the tray near his cupboard. Thank you, mother. Honestly, you don't need to do this for me. Itachi replied with a smile and went back to his book. He expected her to leave, but instead, Ursa scooted beside him. What are you reading? She asked her son. I'm reading about earth benders, mother, Itachi replied. The way they bend is what piques my interest. There are many different forms of earth bending from what I've read. What made you interested in earth benders? Ursa asked, humoring him. Everything. I wish to learn from them. All of these accounts from Fire Nation generals, while reliable in combat, are an inaccurate description of what earth bending is. Most of these accounts are biased. They always comment on how earth bending is weak and that fire bending is superior. However, they fail to see the merit in learning the mechanics of it. While firebenders mostly rely on offensive attacks, earthbenders can utilize their terrain to their advantage. Unlike his original mother, Makoto, he knew that Ursa doesn't have experience as a warrior. Still, she indulges him in his ramblings. Itachi could see Makoto and Ursa in the same light, unlike his father. Aren't you a firebender, Zuko? She asked. Itachi nodded, I am. 
but just learning about firebending from a firebender can prove to be inadequate. To father, firebending is all about power, but fire can also be warm and welcoming. Firebending can give those who don't have a home the warmth they might be lacking. Perhaps that is why the world hates us so much. Firebending can do so much good, but we use it to burn their homes and destroy villages rather than giving them the warmth that the world desperately needs. While we firebenders have flames that burn so hot, the world seems to have grown cold. Ursa smiled proudly at her son, you are an outstanding firebender, yet you are truly a kind child. I'm sure that you will make our family proud. At this, Itachi shed a small tear. His mother's words reminded him of the last words of his first father, Fugaku, words which he could still vividly remember. Even in this new world, remembering the words spoken to him is painful, he doesn't wish to revisit them. Ursa noticed this and wiped the tear from his face, is something wrong, Zuko? Did your father do something, or is it Azula or? No, mother, he choked out, successfully holding his tears back, it has nothing to do with them, I can assure you. I just remembered a book I had read. What is it about? Ursa asked him. He smiled and closed his eyes, placing the book back on the table. I'd rather not talk about it. It's not that interesting. If it's not interesting, why did it make my little boy cry? Hmm. Ursa asked. Tell me about the book one day, okay Zuko? Itachi nodded gladly. Don't worry, mother. I will. Parts of his past life cannot be hidden for a long time. Then again, eleven years is a fairly long time to hide that he has abilities far beyond what a firebender can do. Good night, Zuko. Don't stay up too late, Yura said as she gave him a tight hug which he returned in kind. Good night, Itachi replied as Ursa walked out of the room. Itachi picked up his book again to drown himself in. He read while munching on the rice cakes and sipping the tea Ursa left behind. He could honestly say that these were the most delicious rice cakes he had ever eaten and he looks forward to them every night. It is very peaceful as the moon shines light upon his room. He then heard a slight creak of his door. Turning his head to the one who caused it, he saw bright golden eyes peer at him, Azula? The said girl shyly walked inside the room, I can't sleep, Zuzu. She shifted and looked everywhere, but him, trying to find her words. He could tell she's embarrassed by the whole situation. See can we sleep together? Sure, Itachi quickly replied with a tired smile as he yawned. With a snap of his fingers, his candle went out. He shortly joined Azula in his bed as she stared at the ceiling. Something on your mind? No, Azula replied in monotone. They sat there for a while, drowning in silence. Zuzu. Itachi hummed, I want to become like you one day. I want to be as powerful as you, and win mother's approval. You will grow to be a more powerful firebender than me, Azula. Itachi replied as he too stared at the ceiling. I can already see your potential. Do you think, do you think mom would be proud of me if I became more powerful? If I bring honor to the family? Azula almost pleadingly asked her brother. Mother is already proud of you, Azula, Itachi replied tenderly, but he was met with an angry glare. Is she though? She asked with a loud whisper. I showed her my test results. Even if she hugged me earlier, saying that she's proud, she just walked away from me. Almost as if she was disgusted by me, as if I am a monster. Azula couldn't hold it anymore and cried on Itachi's chest. Am I a mon? Itachi didn't let her finish as he placed a finger on her mouth. You are not a monster, Azula. But, no matter what anyone tells you, what you see, or what you hear, you are not a monster. Itachi hugged her as she continued to cry on his shoulder. I'll talk to mother, tomorrow. Okay. Don't worry, I'll always be here. He felt Azula weakly nod as he caressed her back. Within a few minutes, both were asleep, waiting for a new day to dawn on them. When Itachi woke up the next morning, he felt a weight on his chest. Itachi looked down to see Azula sleeping peacefully. She was lightly snoring and the tears that were on her face last night vanished. The pain she bore last night was gone, leaving only tranquility and serenity. Itachi tried to gently roll her onto her back from his chest, so as to not disturb his younger sister. Slowly, he sneaked away from his bed and dressed for the day. It was typical for Itachi to stir from his slumber very early in the morning to cook himself breakfast. He enjoyed eating breakfast and watching the sunrise. Palace cooks were initially reluctant to let Itachi cook for himself as it's their job to cook for him. Not to mention cooking is known as a commoner trait. Itachi convinced them to let him cook breakfast for himself though. Breakfast is just something to eat in the morning to gain energy for the day ahead. 
Quickly cooking a meal that consists of bread and eggs is easy for Itachi. There are some things in this world that are very similar to his old one, but the animals here seem to be in their own, in between category. In this world, animals are basically a hybrid of two animals from his original world. All jumbled together like one of Orochimaru's experiments. Itachi shuddered the first time he saw them. It reminded him of that slimy snake and his weird fetish for the Uchiha and their Sharingan. It's a good thing that Orochimaru is dead and his treachery from the hidden leaf has been wiped out. What's harder though is a breakfast for Azula. She is a very picky eater and prefers meat in her meals. Not that he blames her, as meat is absolutely delicious, but it's not forever that they will eat meat. His days in the Anbu bore little time for those luxuries, especially during missions where military rations were the only thing that he ate. Tasteless, bland, sometimes even bitter, but it worked. Perhaps even with Azula's natural aptitude in firebending, he doesn't want her to experience the things that he did, food-related or not. The last thing that he wants is for her to be sent to war. Uncle Iroh and his cousin, Lu Ten, were already sent to the front lines by his grandfather and he already sees how it will someday destroy them. No one leaves a war unscathed. All of those who walk through its path will be dead, or lucky enough to survive, only to have scars left, both physical and mental. Itachi made a simple breakfast for himself, just eggs and toasted bread. For Azula, he made a deluxe breakfast, filled with tamagoyaki, rice rolled with nori, and spicy oyakodon, her favorite comfort food. He put it in a tray and carried it with ease. He walked through the cold halls of the palace, passing columns filled with ornate designs of dragons and phoenixes careening to the heavens. Servants halted their work and bowed to him. When he enters the room, he is greeted by a docile Azula. The sun is about to rise, but she held the blanket as close to her as possible. Placing their breakfasts on his study table, he went to his bed and shook her gently, Azula. Azula, it's morning. Azula groaned, wrapping the blankets farther around herself. Five more minutes, she grumbled. Come on, Azula. Your breakfast will get cold. Of course, Itachi knew what he was doing. He could already feel the annoyance that his words brought and it gave him a smile. No longer did he see the terror-stricken face from last night, now, she is just herself. She quickly lifted her body from the bed and stared blankly at her search brother, Zuzu, we're firebenders. We can just reheat our meals ourselves. It's much more delicious if you eat it fresh, Itachi smirked at her remark. Come on, I made your favorite. Plus, I promised to train with you today, remember? Fine, Azula trailed off as she got off his bed, proceeding to the table. When she laid her eyes on her meal, her eyes sparkled in wonder. With haste, she picks up her chopsticks and eats with gusto, it's good, it's, she glanced at her side, seeing Itachi with a smile, observing her. Well, it's not good, it's bad, but, Azula just couldn't make up anything, and shouted loudly at him, it's good, okay, happy? Very, Itachi nodded, preparing his meal, putting the eggs on top of his toast. But just as he was about to eat, Azula interrupted him, what's that? What's what? She pointed at the bread topped with egg, that thing that you're going to eat. It's my breakfast, Itachi said nonchalantly and he already noticed the glare of his sister. He took a bite and continued to eat it nevertheless, Dewari, tis, nafin, he said as he chewed his food. He then saw Azula fidgeting slightly. Itachi already knows her demeanor, when Azula does that, it indicates her suggesting something or wanting to do something. He finds it, endearing in a way. Why you can have my egg rolls? Stammering her words as she is met with silence, I can't have my brother eat something of that amount. It makes you look like a peasant. Azula, Itachi spoke in return, you need to grow strong, and you need that food. Besides, mine is simple, so that you can have a delicious breakfast. That's not an excuse. Azula argued as she pouted, if, if you don't eat this then, she paused, then we won't train together. Itachi is baffled for a moment before making a smile, are you? Sacrificing your time with me just so that I can eat more? What? Got a problem with that, Zuzu? Azula snapped before making a face. Itachi stared at her, but she didn't back down. With a sigh, he took one of the egg rolls and ate it. Azula then gave a smile before returning her attention to her food. The two ate in comfortable silence. When Itachi finished, he started preparing his training equipment for the day readying the scabbard from his jien, and a small pouch filled with shurikens and kanai. What's with your knives and swords, anyway? Azula asked, moving her attention from her food to him, 
I know we discussed this, but really, do you have to be good at everything? It's not everything, Zula. Itachi lightly oiled his GN and sheathing it after, it's just being prepared. What if there is a scenario where I can't use my bending, or using bending would do more harm than good? Take waterbenders for example. If there is a full moon, firebenders are no match for waterbenders as it enhances their waterbending to an unimaginable degree. If I relied heavily on firebending, I would be defeated in an instant. Well, if waterbenders are that strong then why do they not have a large empire and challenge us in battle? Azula asked him, there are, what, 13 full moons in a single year, and still even with amplified strength, they cannot defeat us. It only means that we firebenders are superior to any kind of bending. The southern raids only ended a few years ago, Azula. Itachi smiled, and still, the northern water tribe's defenses are one of the best in the world. An invasion fleet was repelled for years before father was born, and still, I haven't heard of a single battle plan from the generals concerning an invasion. It seems to me that any invasion to the north will fail since its defenses have surely been improved. He shrugged as he tied his training boots. Azula didn't reply and went back to her food. With a few mouthfuls left, she munched her way through her meal until not a spot of rice was left in her bowl. T thank you for the meal, Zuzu. I really appreciate it. She then gave a smile that spread from corner to corner. Itachi replied with a mirthful smile of his own, Good, now prepare for our training, okay. Azula nodded and went straight to her room. As he is the son of a prince, he had the privilege of being able to acquire things from his old life that he lacked. He had the specifications of a standard shinobi kanai and shuriken procured to master Piandao, to have it made for him. At first, the swordmaster doubted Itachi and why he would want to procure such unwieldy weapons, but still, the master made it for him. His father found it very unnecessary, dishonorable even, to use such melee weapons and knives as they could literally just burn their enemies. Itachi insisted on his training and keeping these weapons though, after all, it would only benefit him. When Itachi arrived at his personal training room, Azula wasn't there yet. In courtesy of this, he sat on the pavement quietly, waiting for his dear sister. He examined the room given to him by his father. From the sides, there are various ornaments of weaponry placed on wall racks, such as large spears and swords. On the wall that is made with red granite, there is a scroll that reads, Only the mighty can rise with the sun. Azula arrived in the room shortly after him wearing her standard training robes. Ready for your lesson, Azula? He could see the excitement within Azula's eyes once he spoke. It's very clear to him that she's been waiting for this moment. Her smile beaming with happiness made this morning far more pleasant than what Itachi expected it to be. It's time with his sister after all, and he has all the time in the world to enjoy it. She nodded without saying a word and prepared herself, breathing deeply. Itachi did the same in front of her, it goes something like this. Azula made way for his demonstration, staring at him intently ready to watch every detail, not wanting to miss any moves. His body moved into his keita, legs not too wide apart and his hands open. His right hand placed near his mouth and his left directly in front of him. His open left hand clenched tightly into a fist, flicking it lightly as it formed fire. Spinning his back towards his right, he let out a surge of fire from his right fist. Again, he spun to his right and Azula can see him gaining power from his momentum, putting it in his right foot as he kicked, creating flames. That move is called Agni's Wrath. It's all about breath control, from the smallest amount of lethal fire to a strong surge of it. The first two moves are to gain ground from your opponent, and while they fall back, you strike. First, you will do the moves first without bending, and if you can do it, then we will add your bending. Training is another story for Itachi as Azula is an adept firebender, teaching her new techniques with little difficulty. After 10 tries Azula could already do Agni's wrath without bending, and 10 more to do the same thing with it. He could see her potential to surpass him in terms of bending. Itachi might be a prodigy, but a prodigy's reign cannot last that long to someone who is as competitive as her. Firebending is fun for Azula. She loves games and firebending both being competitions and for a competitive person like Azula, she thrives. Her determination and thirst for progress is what makes her firebending truly amazing. What is peculiar about her bending though is that he can see blue streaks at the origin of her fire, eventually leading to a normal fire at the end. From what he recalls only the strongest avatars and dragons can manifest fire of that color. It can't be a manifestation of Suzano or Amaterasu as Azula didn't display any noteworthy abilities in terms of ninja arts. 
even the Sharingan. However, Firebending and the Sharingan do have one thing in common, they get their power from rage and emotion. Airbending flies through freedom of will and disconnection of the material. Waterbending flows with emotion, but discourages dissonance, earthbending inerts and stills with patience. Firebending sears in its flames, the more fuel, the larger and more powerful the fire. They rest as the servants provide them with cool water, slathering a clean towel on his sweat-ridden face. Azula did so too as she rests her body on the floor, and just let the breeze flow within the confines of the room. After their small break, they continued their exchange. Bouts of fire raged throughout the room, making the day even brighter for the two. For Itachi, it isn't even training anymore, they are having fun and just bonded with their shared time. Sure, he is still teaching her, but their smiles can't be wiped from their faces. This time would be different, he wouldn't lie to his sibling anymore or keep her out of things. To even think of his sister as an emotionless killing machine, her entire life being honed to the point of wanting to kill anyone who stands in her way. No, he would never make the same mistake again. As the two are about done, Azula sat near the garden while Itachi gathered more water and poured it into the two cups. Itachi carefully sat next to her as she drank the cup in silence, lazily observing the morning sky. But rather than the sky to be bright, storm clouds gathered above, shading the palace darkness. So, have I paid my debts, Zula? Quite. Azula gave a sigh of relief and placed the cup beside her, but do you have time later? Itachi is reminded of one thing, he is trying to make ends meet. Sure, but after dinner, he answered despondently trying not to meet her eyes. Why? Homework. Or do you want to play a game? Azula grumbled under her breath, you always say that. After dinner, always after dinner. She paused, I just, I just want to know why you are so strong. That way I can follow what you're doing. It is no secret that he himself is a firebending prodigy, but he's just that, a prodigy. If he were to face off against his uncle Iroh, cousin Lu Ten, or even his father Ozai, he will surely lose. He speculates that his body converts chakra to Kai and vice versa with Yotan, Yang release. And it is not an easy task especially if it is now back to his old child self's chakra levels. Even his father doubted if he was a bender at all in his early years. Ozai values only one thing, power, and without firebending is to be devoid of power. Although, he is not sure if chakra techniques work on Kai users, as he hasn't used any genjutsu in his new life as he found no scenario of using it and he doubts it would work at all. Genjutsu relies on manipulating the target's chakra network of their five senses, and this world relies on Kai, a diluted version of chakra that locks one in the element that they are born in. But if Yotan can convert chakra to Kai, why can he not convert it into other elements? The best answer he can come up with right now is his Keke Jenke from his past life, thus locking his converted Kai to only fire and nothing else. Itachi put those thoughts aside and gave his attention to Azula. Itachi ruffled her hair, she tried to get away, but eventually gave in, you don't need to follow me, Azula. You are the architect of your own destiny, and I'm simply guiding you to forge it. The rest is up to you. Which is why I want to hang out later, Zuzu. Azula screamed, planting both of her hands on the pavement, don't you want to hang out with me? Of course, I do. Itachi gave her a warm smile, but you have to wait after I finish what I'm reading, I have just about ten pages left. Now it's after reading when earlier it was after dinner. Azula shouted which surprised Itachi. She crossed her arms and pouted while she turned her head away from him, you just don't want to spend time with me. Itachi chuckled nervously, if I had all the time in the world, I would spend it with you. Azula's face didn't waver and stared hardly on the floor, if I don't want to be with you, why am I here in the first place? Hmm. Because you are doing it out of pity, she grumbles. I'm not doing that Azula and you know it, Itachi said with a firm tone, placing his hand on her shoulder, he felt her flinch but she let it stay, how about this, let's read together later, how does that sound? Azula's eyes lit up, she tried to suppress it, but her small smile betrays her, well if you don't mind, she quickly got close to him, until those two familiar fingers poked her forehead. Recoiling in the impact, her cheeks bloomed red, hiding her face in embarrassment. Sorry, Azula, Itachi patted her head, but I have to go now, okay? Walking in the halls of this palace is something that he also had to get used to. The royal palace is almost ten times the size of the Uchiha clan compound and only falls short of the hidden leaf. Even if his family has the largest house in the Uchiha compound, 
it still doesn't compare to the massive size of the new throne room alone. Even the Hokage's residence wasn't this lavish. Though the palace is huge, Itachi does feel colder in its opulence. This palace is a symbol to the rest of his new family's might, honor, and luxury, standing tall atop an extinct volcano. With a single stroke of a brush from his grandfather, armies raise the banner of war across many fronts. He wants to find and go down a path of peace, but he also knows that it won't be easy. For a hundred years this world has been in war, peace would be a foreign concept to all those who seek power and vengeance. And this palace that he now stood upon, is a symbol of that conflict of war and peace. If he wants to protect Azula, then he must plan for a world of peace rather than hostilities, a harmony in place of intrigue. Itachi asked the palace staff if they've seen Princess Ursa and they pointed in the direction of the gardens. The sun didn't shine above, nevertheless, his mother sat under the tree near the pond, gently feeding the turtle ducks with small pieces of bread. Her shoulders slumped and her eyes were not even on the ducks, but rather on the opposite side of the garden. His foot slowly paced to the garden, mother, Itachi spoke with firm conviction, letting his presence known. Ursa's shoulders jolted in surprise, but in the instance that she laid her eyes upon him, he noticed that her mood brightened. Oh, Zuko, I didn't see you there. Done with your training, I hope? Or are you hungry? I can call the servants to make you some refreshments. Itachi shook his head in return and sat near his mother, quietly averting his gaze to the turtle ducks. That won't be necessary, mother. I don't want to trouble them any further. He gave his mother a quick glance, I want to talk. Of course, Zuko. Ursa enveloped Itachi in a one-arm hug which he welcomed. Is there something troubling you? Is it about the book? No I want to talk about Azula. He felt Ursa's arm slightly tensed over his remark but it didn't leave his shoulder. This is a mistake that he knew he should fix. Sasuke relied on him, but deep inside he knew Sasuke sought approval from his original father, Fugaku. Even though his father loved Sasuke to his dying breath, Sasuke did not know this in the early years of his life. What Itachi is asking is for their attention to be turned to their younger sibling. Did she do something to you? Ursa asked with her words laced with deep concern. She didn't, Itachi replied with a sigh. I'm just concerned about her, about how, how she feels about being here. Ursa's eyebrows quirked. What do you mean, Zuko? I don't want her to feel any unease. Itachi smiled as he turned to Ursa. Recently, I've noticed she is quite distant to others while also using violence to lash out on the servants. Meanwhile, she is trying very hard to prove her honor worthy, while receiving nothing in return. I'm afraid that if this continues, she will be swayed to the wrong path. One that wants to achieve power for power's sake because of people disregarding her. That path will not lead to warmth, but to chaos. Ursa's discomfort turned into a warm smile. Since Azula was born, you've always looked out for her. It almost seems you two are inseparable. She pinched Itachi's cheek. There are even times when she was just a baby, you took care of her rather than the servants. You are very mature for your age, Zuko. Thank you, mother, but Azula needs help, and I'm afraid I cannot do it alone, I need your help. Itachi asked pleadingly, she also needs your warmth. I know that I've been getting a lot of praise, but the shadow that I cast extinguishes Azula's fire. Itachi can feel Ursa wince from his words but she didn't show it, whatever she feels right now, will shape her life. Itachi's words were met by silence and spoke up. Mother. How do you feel about Azula? Again, Ursa didn't speak but her face morphed that into a look of deep concern and hurt. Itachi held her hand softly and she didn't reciprocate. You can trust me, mother, I won't tell Azula what you feel about her. Besides, I've already seen that there are no palace servants nor eavesdroppers nearby so your words are safe with me. Ursa just gave a smile filled with remorse. I love your sister, Zuko. I just feel uncomfortable with her attitude, and I have to reprimand Azula for doing something that's wrong. You know that, don't you? We scold you because we love you. Perhaps those acts are done so she can gain the attention she lacks, Itachi spoke gently, sometimes, feelings cannot just be expressed by words. She is young, confused, and needing of care and direction in her life. Maybe that's why she does outrageous acts, such as setting fire to her firebending instructor's beard or burning a servant's clothes. Maybe she does it because she needs warmth. I alone cannot give her the love that she needs, I'm just a boy. There is a tense atmosphere that surrounds them, but Itachi knows the only way he can convince Ursa is by confronting her. Even if she feels nervous, he can tell she wants to continue the conversation. However, she is trying to find words that weren't there at all. 
trying anything to rebut her son, Zuko. Why are you doing this? Ursa asked, but quickly clamped her mouth shut as if she asked a stupid question. Yet Itachi didn't form any face and remained perfectly calm, because I care for her, and Azula needs help before she strays to the wrong path. Even if it means sacrificing my honor, just for her to live in the path of righteousness is enough for me. I will always be there for her, no matter what happens. Itachi paused. Please, mother. Help me. He bowed his head, begging. Ursa knows what her son is asking, for her to soften up to Azula and give her attention, rather than Zuko. Giving a huge sigh, she spoke, All right, I'll do what I can. I honestly thought that you were going to talk about that book. It was very kind of you to come to me about this, and Zuko, to me you're not a boy, far from it. From what I see, you are fit enough to be a man. Thank you, mother, Itachi replied as he relaxed his shoulders, in time, I will tell you about the book. Then at least tell me what it's called so that I can read it, Ursa spoke up. Unfortunately, I've been trying to find it too, but recently it's been lost months ago when I was trying to find it. Itachi said in an evasive tone, but Ursa didn't notice it. But the name? It's called Samadare. Dot and done. So for now, I'm just establishing some relationships with Itachi, Zuko and the subsequent chapters will be plot heavy. And wow I never expected this story to blow up as this is just a side project of mine and I've tried to address the main issue here in regards to readers. Itachi is overpowered and I've tried to nerf him by depleting his chakra levels like that of his young self, so in time he would regain further chakra. Also, Itachi is written in a way that despite his powers, the choices that he made gave further consequence to his actions so I would try that also. Itachi quietly observed Azula and her new friends from a tree branch. His first impressions of them were good as at least. Someone is there for his sister besides him. In his past life, Sasuke is very distant from anyone that is not his kin and drowned himself in his studies. He even tried to hide behind him when Sasuke met his best friend Shisui. Thus, when Ursa fulfilled his wish, Azula's mood gradually improved and she made friends. However, he can see that Azula isn't comfortable and is rather apprehensive by the sudden change of approach of their mother, but Azula nevertheless welcomed her. Itachi could see that they felt comfortable with her rather than enacting fear in their hearts. The company was what made their friendship. He didn't know them personally and Azula never introduced them to him, but he got their names from her stories in times of their bonding. The girl with the long brown braided pigtail is Tai Lee from his evaluation. Exited, energetic, and overall optimistic, Itachi comes to the conclusion that she would have a positive influence on Azula's circle. And her physique is quite excellent very close to a typical Konoha Kunoichi, with the ability to use acrobatics like a cartwheel. In all honesty, he doesn't like delving into her as it reminded him of his childhood friend Izumi. Those brown hair and eyes, he can't help but skew his sight away. Not that he has feelings for Tai Li but the resemblance can be quite unnerving, even for him. And his memories of the Sukuyomi that he cast to Izumi before she died brought the pain to another degree. Some nobles or even servants wondered how he had not courted a girl of his age. All he does is brush all the contenders, but the anguish of her death remained in his mind, now that he had time to think about it. On a lighter note, the other one is called Mai. The girl wore two buns and bangs hang just below her eyebrows, making her somewhat of a meek individual. Her behavior is that of pure shyness with the presence of Tai Li and Azula but still feels comfortable with the two. Apart from that, he has no more scruples about her and just thinks of Mai as a friend of his sister's. Itachi smiled as his sister played with them and ran around the garden. And since he didn't need to be here, he slowly landed so as not to alert his presence to them and proceeded on his way to the training room. Without anything to disturb him for a day and Azula is busy with her friends, he decided that it would be a good time to practice more of his firebending and using it less. And in a short time, he practices the basic forms of firebending, trying to make anyone less suspicious. Trying to make, Katen, Gokaku no Jutsu, fire style, great fireball technique, in this close proximity would only lead to this room burning. And by rethinking this, his practice of ninjutsu is very limited in his new life, only using taijutsu techniques and knowledge of Katen, fire style, enhancing his firebending. Itachi quickly snapped out of his reverie and began to shift his body towards the advanced forms of firebending. These are the ones his father thought, the most aggressive techniques of the martial art. It is explosive, focusing on respiration and liberation like an angry tiger. However, he saw a flaw that has this style. 
although it gives a huge advantage in strength and pure unmatched power, the movements, for him, are easy enough to read. To mitigate this, he tried to make his firebending less explosive but rather quick. Only by using enough force not to drain his energy and subdue his opponent without using an excessive amount of force. And if push comes to shove, then he will have to go very aggressive with its style, a faint style so to speak. However, even here alone, he heard voices and went down the path of his training room. Normally, they would be his grandfather's messengers, launching reports from the Earth Kingdom about the successes of his uncle Iroh and his son Lu Ten. But the voices of those who come down the hall were distinguished from what he expected. Do you think Azula would find us here? Itachi heard from the hall. From the joyful voice that the person possessed, it must be Tai Li. I don't know, to be honest. Let's just find a way to hide, I'm sick of her winning every time. The bored but determined voice, cutting smoothly with every word in a calculated precision, must be my. Itachi did not focus on his training, but rather on the conversation on the two while still doing his training to set up a facade. His hands are slowly descending to relax and potentially, not injure Azula's guests. He then heard a gasp behind him and it sent a little smile on his face. Never did he imagine in his life that he would meet a friend of his younger sibling in a non-threatening way or not as an undead person that needs to unseal what revived him. Here's a warm day where there was no threat near them. Even in his past life, Itachi was never able to meet Naruto personally until he returned to Konoha as part of the Akatsuki so this is something new and fun for him. Itachi slowly turned his head toward their shocked faces and found them with a small smile. What can I do for you? Itachi spoke smoothly. The two girls wore a blush until Mai bowed down. And seeing Tai Li just froze there, the normally stoic lady forced her friend to bow too with her hand. We're sorry that we are intruding your training, Prince Zuko. Is he? Tai Li stuttered. He is. Mai growled and tried to hide her blush. Now we have to get out of here or... Please, there's no need to bow down, Itachi said in amusement. You two are Azula's friends, I presume? The two rose their heads but their gazes weren't at him, why yes, Prince Zuko. Tai Li spoke. Itachi laughs to their surprise, you don't need to address me as Prince Zuko here in the palace. Right now, I'm just Zuko and you two are guests here in the palace. I hope that the palace suits well with your accommodations. It does, but we really have to go, Pierre I mean Zuko. My bowed slightly, we are in the middle of something. Itachi quirked his eyebrows, I assume that something has to do with my little sister and you two are in such a hurry. What? Did my sister did something to you like burn your clothes or just chase you through the palace? No, Air Zuko. This time Tai Li spoke to him. Azula is quite nice to us and we're playing hide and seek so. We really really have to go, because she will beat us again, it's not fair. And now Itachi is smiling internally while keeping a straight face, oh? Hide and seek. Well, she will probably beat you, I can see it. He waited a while for them to speak out loud, but the two kept their mouth shut. He guessed that they're hoping somehow for him to leak any information in regards to defeating his sister in this great game, but he is in a helping mood. Itachi gave a big false sigh as he crossed his arms and shook his head, but I guess you no longer need help since you are two are in a hurry. So if you have no further questions, he trailed and those two sets of eyes who yearned for answers stared at him like he stole candy from them. When he was about to close the door, Tai Li cried out, wait. She blurted out and Itachi's eyes widened. We really really want to beat Azula this time, and. And. She baffled with embarrassment, but she bowed before him, we need your help, Prince Zuko. In this, Itachi laughed, lightly tapping Tai Li on her shoulder. A little help is something that I don't mind. This mundane game where Azula just wins every time just became interesting to the girl who hides her emotions. Of course, she still wanted to visit the royal palace from time to time and she did so with her two friends. Her family is quite demanding to gain the privilege to the point that she is quite distant from her parents. But then she's dealing with these two unknowns, a noble, like her, and none other than the princess herself, who has become her friends, and it's the only escape she has from her domineering family. Prince Zuko is quite the talk in the circles of the Fire Nation, spreading even into the Royal Fire Academy for girls. He is handsome, brilliant, and extremely talented in firebending, so much so that every girl in the academy and the female populace of the capital wants to talk to him or even take a glance at him. And she is also not immune to this, Zuko fever, that the academy has, having to hide her blush while he's looking at her with his gentle smile. 
Mai was sure that there was some exaggeration towards the story of his exploits yet here he is, proving those rumors quite true. It is almost rare for a person even a noble to have a talk with him as he is rumored to be a bookworm and quite protective of Azula. Mai even speculates that the prince is out of the league from any Fire Nation girl that he can look into and finds them boring. And thanks to Tai Li, he is walking with them, giving them a crash course on how to beat Azula in this simple hide-and-seek game. Well, if it was simple for them both. She aspires to know more about this mythical prince and why even she got the fever. I remember using a technique on Zula that she could never beat, something that has to do with the use of baits. Zuko spoke to them in a low tone. Yet she can notice the lacing of pleasure in his words. She raged on and on about the way I cheated because every time she had hoped to find me, which encounters her as a piece of log. She gave a hearty laugh while trying to cover her mouth and provided the fun that Azula can, in fact, be defeated, in the funniest way possible. How'd you do it? Mai asked while holding her laughter but Zuko just put his finger on the top of his mouth giving them a wink. It's a secret. Um. Zuko sir. Tai Li stammered, R. Are you going to teach us how to beat Azula? Zuko didn't hide his amusement, shaking his head and chortling, I was getting into it. But you can use my technique to use a decoy to distract someone. Although, the bait has to be fast and knows how to get around. And while the decoy is making a distraction, the other one should run away. Who's faster among you? In a quick move, Tai Li raised her hand, I do. She murmured high and with pride. Mai can't deny Tai Li's dexterity and athletics barring only Azula's but she can't help but feel jealous at this moment that she quickly got his attention. All right. Zuko gave a nod. Tai Li, you will distract by using any methods without getting caught. If she's distracted, get out of there fast. And you, Mai, just stay nearby but don't stay close. Once my sister takes the bait, get out of there as quietly as you can. If one of you is caught, keep quiet, and don't snitch. Then he put his hands on their shoulders, giving it a slight squeeze, got it? Mai and Tai Li gave a grunt and almost saluted like soldiers. This no longer feels like a game. It feels like a covert mission given to them by the prince. The two headed for an opening in the garden but remained carefully hidden behind the bushes. Mai quickly moved to another bush in front of them and they both waited for Azula to appear. Zuko was wearing a quiet smile as he watched from afar, but they may already have more than that serene smile, it's like he is examining each muscle that they twitch. He was hiding pretty convincingly behind a pole shaded by the roof and even at first glance, no one would notice immediately. After a few seconds of silence, they heard footsteps coming from where they expected. With a quick hand gesture, Zuko signaled to them to stay down and remain silent. Normally at the moment, they were hiding and expecting Azula not to find them or just peek to see where she is, only for them to be seen. Now, Zuko whispered to them loudly. Quickly Tai Li shakes the bush while Mai moves away from them tenderly. They then listen to steps coming on them, but Tai Li escaped in time just before Azula could see them. There was a short sense of terror as Tai Li escaped the sights of Azula and hid behind the cover. For a few moments, they expected Azula to catch her, but surprisingly, she did not. There wasn't an, I've got you, or even a tackling from the princess, just grumbling that it was a noise. It worked. Tai Li whispered to herself and her sense of dread turned into elation. My, it worked. She turned to Zuko's face and saw that his palm met his face. You absolute dumb dumb. Even Azula couldn't help but humor at Tai Li's plight at the sheer stupidity of the situation. She clutched her stomach not even caring that they were in the middle of a game. Mai just rose up, walked towards, and gave a huge sigh. It worked like a charm, just as expected of the prince that she so idolizes. But instead jeopardized by an excitable Tai Li that just hung her head in shame. Ha! I win! Even though Azula declared victory, she still couldn't stop laughing. It is then that Zuko came forward to them that every one of them quieted down. His hand is still on his face, maybe a hint of disappointment. Mai can't tell. But she knows that their standing towards the prince would have been diminished and this is a test for them so that they are accepted in the palace. It was until Prince Zuko removed his hand from his face that Mai knew what would be the answer. You two did well. Zuko spoke placidly, however, everything hasn't been set and things can change. He then turned his eyes to hers, and while you are faced with failure, it doesn't mean that you should just give up like that. For what it's worth, you two executed the plan well but things. You know what happened. Wait. You helped them. Azula shouted and pouted. And you too, 
how did you even meet my brother? Oh, they are just passing by my training room while they are trying to find a place to hide. Zuko gave his sister a quick smile. They asked me for help and I helped them. But since you won and technically they followed my plan, he placed his hand on Azula's shoulders but he didn't forget to give her and Tai Li a quick wink. You won against me, even at least for once. But Zuko. Mai was about to retort as Tai Li still couldn't speak in utter embarrassment. They were the ones who failed the prince and now he is taking the blame for it. But they don't deserve that kind of treatment, especially from the prince himself. Yet his next words did something to Mai. Zuko raised his hand swiftly and turned to them, it is my plan and you two just followed it so I take the entire blame. Don't you two beat yourself up over this, okay? There will always be a next time, he winked at them. At that moment, Mai swore her heart skipped a beat. For a moment, Azula stopped laughing and stared at her brother almost in disbelief. No way. This means. You're going to teach me that technique. Her smile then turned to a grin and hopped all over the place. What Mai didn't expect though was that Azula hugged both her and Tai Li very tightly. Thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you. Azula then let go as the two of them panted for air. You really took their breath away there, Zula. And you too, please get along with my sister, okay? We do get along. Azula defended. Also, I was going to introduce them to you today, Zuzu. You really couldn't wait. And not mess with my dear sweet sister. Zuko interrupted her and ruffled her hair causing her to blush. That is a thing I couldn't pass up. But still. Ha! I beat you this time. Azula pointed directly at him. But this time, Zuko crossed his arms and gave a smug smile. And it means those times you accused me of cheating are invalid. I won, truly. Azula growled and threw herself at Zuko and gave him punch after punch. Tai Li and Mai were about to intervene as they know when Azula gets angry. Nobody crosses her but Zuko just laughs it off like it is nothing. He even is amused by the whole affair and just kept dodging and shielding her punches. They also couldn't help but smile at the ordeal. Soon Azula too threw fits of giggles and stopped her assault. Azula then straightened her back and clapped her hands. So, Zuzu, this is Mai and Tai Li, they are my friends at the academy. Tai Li, Mai, this is my brother, Zuko, but I'm sure you already know now because someone spoiled all the fun. She shouted at Zuko as she pouted. Stupid Zuzu. Don't worry about me, I'm glad you two are having fun at the palace. If you need anything or need refreshments just ask one of our servants and they will provide you with anything you need. And if you want some funny stories where Azula. Okay. Azula cut off her brother and still, he gave her a teasing smile while she huffed. Let's get some snacks shall we? Mai realized one thing, that it's almost like the two are inseparable and their banter with each other really seems like they are really close with each other. She couldn't help but smile at the thought. Azula is the only one who can even tease the prince like that yet he takes it with a laugh. Her admiration for Zuko only grew as she saw another side of the prince that no one has seen outside the palace. Maybe even one day, he could take a look at her and appreciate her too. To Azula, his brother Zuko is an anomaly from everyone in the palace. To her, powerful firebenders came with their personalities, they are volatile, ready to explode in a matter of seconds. Her grandfather, Fire Lord Azulon, is one such individual but she can already see the cloak of age draws upon the weary Fire Lord. Once a powerful firebending general, his flames reduced entire cities to ashes and continued what the great Fire Lord Sozin established. Her father Ozai is one of the most powerful firebenders yet he is cold and cruel. Her father's form of love is sheer discipline with ruthlessness. If she were to win her father's love and affection, she abides by their creed. But her mind is very conflicted as Zuko is also a firebending master. At just seven years of age, he graduated from the academy and emerged top of his class. To Zuko himself, he is only an adept firebender, but to her, she is a sheer master of the art. And instead of a steaming pot that is typical of firebenders and admittedly, herself, Zuzu is very calm, rational, and always keeps his emotions in check. Azula expected her brother to detest the nickname, Zuzu, enough to entertain her, but what happened is that Zuko wholeheartedly accepted it with a huge smile. It is a huge surprise to her, and then she kept using it. Unlike her mother that is cold and distant, her father searing in sheer heat. Zuzu is the warmth that her family lacked. She is very insecure about how he always gets the spotlight in the family but unlike the two, Zuko is always there. If Zuko weren't there by her side, what would happen to her? She shuddered at the thought of his brother being gone or just killed in battle. 
Even if throughout the months, her mother warmed up to her and not the one she was supposed to be, Azula still holds some reservations regarding her mother. But Zuko is consistent, not changing his attitude towards her and at times he spoils her with his spare time. Like reading books with him or training with him, it's a pleasure that she always cherishes. True to the behest of his brother, she listened to him and stopped burning everyone randomly but she still berates them. To her, they are just peasants who are just lucky enough to be working for the most prestigious family in the entire world. And Azula doesn't understand why Zuzu even gives them kindness, but he is, after all, an anomaly and an enigma, even to herself. So right now, she is focused on training the phoenix style her brother taught her. Up until recently she has beaten him in their game of hide and seek, but it is only when he helped her friends, Tai Li and Mai. Every sweat that drops down that floor is another drive for her to manifest that technique that even her father doesn't know about. Azula positioned herself in the middle of the room letting the hot air fuel her inner fire. She stood up straight, chest out, stomach in, hands on the side, and jumped up in the air. Then she let the kai flow through her and tried to expunge a barrage of fire through various kicks and punches but Azula could only make three until she landed on the ground. Damn it. I was so close. She wasn't though but her target is five flames. How could Zuzu do that? There must be some kind of trick. Azula pondered as she rose from the ground and repeated it again and again until her body forced her to stop. In the end, her venture to a different firebending style brew no fruit and left her sweaty and panting for water. The servants were smart enough to give her a pot of cold water and a clean towel to freshen her up, and she let herself rest, panting for air and waiting for her body to get enough rest and push it further. Her mind is her only limit and she will break her limits and become someone powerful like her brother and her father. However, she didn't notice someone walking entering the door. Of course, no peasant would dare intervene in the reverie of the princess so she didn't expect that she is getting a visit from her father. But he didn't just let his steps be heard. Ozai basically marched right into the room without any subtlety or care and sat on its center. Azula, stand up and perform Niniji no Makoto, now. Her father spoke in a loud and firm voice. As you wish, father. Azula quickly stood up in attention as adrenaline rushed through her arteries and fueled her fire. Niniji no Makoto is one of the most ancient firebending techniques, yet one of the most advanced and only passed down from the Fire Nation royal family. She didn't even look at her father as she prepared her keita. Again her body is betraying her but her will won, pressing on with the keita. It involves her right hand being close to her right chest while the left's ring, pinky, and thumb curled and away from her body. Her legs are wide apart in a stride and carefully light. With a huge force, she leapt to the air and kicked her left leg, and using the momentum gained she swung her right leg, both kicks expunging fire. However, her body betrayed her will and crashed to the ground. Azula could not see her father's face but the thought of just failing him is enough for her mind to be enveloped in fear, and rightly so. What is this farce? Her father growled. Your brother mastered it in just a single day, and when I taught you the move weeks before, you still failed to meet my expectations. How many forms did he already master than you? Her eyes dared not to her tears flow and just gritted her teeth in her father's words, 30, father. 30. Ozai spoke with firm authority, you are lagging behind. But father, silence. Do it. Again, he growled at her. Ozai's words alone gave Azula the energy that she needed to do the technique, and again, and again, and again, and again, until her body collapsed to the ground in sheer exhaustion. She expected harsh words coming from her father but when she glanced at where her father sat, with her remaining strength, he wasn't even there. And she is only to blame, she is too weak and wasn't strong enough to gain her father's affection. Silent tears flow from her face, lying there on the floor. Her mouth didn't whimper and her watered eyes stared walls of the room. Her father can't see her like this, but it doesn't mean that he will come back to comfort her. He entered quickly as he went, not even caring the struggles of her own, only the results. Maybe she isn't worthy of even being a part of the royal family. She is so weak that she couldn't even gain the love of her father and the validation of her mother. With her remaining strength, she rose up and quietly dried her empty tears her foot going on autopilot to her room, until she collapsed midway to her destination. Azula didn't hear Ursa catching her exhausted body and quietly lifted her towards her bed. Her mother might care for her, and in the darkest recesses of her mind does she yearn for her love. When her half-lidded eyes closed, she wondered if Zuko was not the caring brother that she has, 
Would she turn out to even be a more vicious monster than she is now? Would her mother and Agni forbid her father resent her? Only in her darkest thoughts can she ask those questions and receive no answer. Itachi had lived this new life for many years, yet he still did not know what to make of his new father. However, the recent incident in which Azula was exhausted to the point of collapse made Ozai come under the Uchiha's radar. Itachi didn't care for his new father nearly as much as he did Fugaku, but he still respects him out of love for Azula. She dearly loves their father and outright killing him might result in Azula experiencing the same fate as Sasuke, even if his actions are done out of love. Interactions with his father are rather sparse. Ozai does not seem to like interacting with Itachi much. It's almost as if when he fire bends in front of his father, Ozai, while impressed, has some sort of deep resentment towards him. Outside of training and dinner, there is thick tension between Ozai and Itachi. However, what doesn't make sense to Itachi is that even with these negative feelings Ozai has for him, he still trains him. He speculates that something happened between his father and mother as in a single night, he could feel the winds change directions abruptly. However, Itachi didn't dive deep into their affairs. As long as Ozai stays in line and doesn't do something drastic, he will keep his sword sheathed. Itachi wants to use his Sharingan to interrogate Ozai but it's too dangerous to use it here, the Sharingan has new limits, ones that he doesn't know of. Every time his Mangekyo Sharingan activates, it puts a strain on his body and expends far more chakra than a typical Uchiha would. Meaning that if he were to use his Dojutsu, it would tire him out more than Hitaki Kakashi's Sharingan did. With that restraint, if he were to use Sukuyomi, Yu Yang, he could be bedridden for at least a week or even die. It was with these thoughts in his mind, Itachi decided to talk to his father. It's a bright morning when he disturbs his father in his royal office, with light shining through the windows as well as the sound of chirping birds. Yet the atmosphere that Itachi brought with him is like the coldness of his blade. He could almost feel the heat emanating from the man, the inner fire within him releasing heat to intimidate anyone who graces his father's presence. Itachi is used to these kinds of things, and facing a man with the dojutsu of the six paths can make things like these seem minuscule in comparison to others. They're laid on the table as an imported Da Hong Pao tea the servants poured earlier. This tea is imported from the colonies, Zuko. They said only kings of the Earth Kingdom were the only ones who could afford such a luxury, but now, we reap the benefits from those imbeciles. Ozai snorted before taking a sip of his tea. Itachi inspected the tea that was present on the table, the heat steaming from the cup. He quickly grabbed it and gave it a quick whiff before taking a quick sip. Indeed, the Da Hong Pao is a complex oolong tea, quite superior to a standard one, but he felt that something was missing from the tea although he couldn't place it. Kindly placing the cup on the table, again he shifted his attention to his father. I didn't know you were fond of tea, father. Ozai smelled the tea and closed his eyes. Only the best kinds of tea are worth my attention. Such teas are selected through rigorous processes, making sure they truly are the best. Those that don't make the cut are nothing but the rabble. However, the best ones who already have amazing taste still need heat for them to truly bring out the greatest of flavors. Don't you agree? Itachi internally sighed. I don't, father. Why? Ozai asks with his brow raised, slowly swirling his cup while studying him. Itachi knew that he was trying to intimidate him with that long stare, but he put up a face of indifference. A skilled brewer can make a mediocre tea leaf into an exquisite tea when brewed properly. A luxurious tea leaf may have an advantage at first, but if they aren't brewed consistently and kept up to standards, it will be surpassed by good brewing. Or in other words, poor brewing can ruin a great tea leaf, making a mediocre drink. Ozai narrowed his eyes and gave a hum. An astute assessment, Zuko. I see you've learned from my tutelage. One must be pushed to exceed their limits if one is to improve. While I do agree that poor brewing can cause weakness in a strong tea leaf, even an experienced brewer with a poor tea leaf cannot surpass a mediocre brewer with an exceptional tea leaf. Thus, it is within our nature, our blood, to surpass anyone as long as we are pushed with constant pressure. Excessive pressure can lead even the best leaf tasting unpalatable, Father, Itachi replied, his voice cool and suave not letting the hint of Ozai's cold voice swipe at him. Da Hong Pao is best when served three to four brews, but if you brew the same tea leaf over and over again, it will lose its taste until nothing is left but boiled water. Ozai grew quiet at first before giving a snicker, then laughing at Itachi's face, placing the cup of unfinished tea on the table. 
You misunderstand me, Zuko. You are astute, I can give you that, but you are still naive. If no pressure or heat is given to the tea, what then? It will not develop its flavor, it will instead be nothing more than a mediocre drink of leaf juice. His smile then turned to a thin line. I know what I am doing, Zuko, and don't you dare lecture me again. Itachi didn't give in to his new father's intimidation, no matter how much Ozai tried. I am not lecturing you, father. I'm merely expressing my thoughts. If you wish to express your thoughts, then stop cowering behind a metaphor. I will not listen to a coward. If you have a problem with the way I train Azula, I'd recommend approaching it differently next time. Besides, why are you worried about your sister? Are you not only a coward but weak as well? Ozai snapped at Zuko. Caring about family is a weakness, Itachi says coolly, trying to act like an obedient son. Showing it is, Zuko. Why even bother training with Azula, when you can be refining your techniques? Spending your time with her only diminishes the time you spend to become a fully realized firebender like I am. Itachi answers promptly. I choose to spend my time with Azula because she has the same amount of potential I have. She quickly learns when watching my techniques and she is a ferocious firebender. Training her to the point of exhaustion won't do any good, it will only build up resentment until she's out of control. It will fuel her to become an even more powerful firebender. Ozai leaned closer to Itachi's unmoving face. Are you suggesting that I'm a bad teacher, Zuko? Are you insinuating that the one who turned you, honed you, into what you are now is an inadequate teacher for Azula? Itachi stood his ground, unwavering even to the threats of Ozai. All I ask, father, is not to exhaust Azula to the point of passing out. That's all. I'm not implying anything. It would be detrimental for Azula if she continues towards this path. Would it? Ozai asks Itachi, he knows that he ticked Ozai off, the heat in the room is beginning to rise. I'm training her to become a better version of herself. Through struggle and might she will succeed and if not then she was a failure from the start. I'm not just training her physically, Zuko, I'm also training her will. There are better methods than grinding her until she breaks. Itachi slowly raises his voice, his anger subtle but laced in his tone. You may have topped your class, but you are still my son. Ozai slams his fist on the table, there are even small streaks of steam getting out of his nose. How dare you lecture me about how I should train my daughter? How dare you say that my method won't do any good when it has produced you? Your training methods may have worked with me, but Azula and I are different. Itachi carefully swerves his hand towards the table. She needs a different approach. We might share the same blood, even the same potential, but if you continue like this it would be damaging to Azula and her firebending. Enough. Ozai shouts at Itachi's face, and it is still emotionless despite the outburst of the prince. I've had enough. He slams his hand on the table. Some of the tea spills over the table but neither cares. I will not have you lecture me, your father. Ozai let out a huge breath of fire and closed his eyes. The tea has run cold and my patience is running thin. Get out of my sight, Zuko. Quietly, Itachi stood up but not before looking at Ozai who was, to his surprise, patiently waiting for him to walk out the room. Inside his mind, Itachi is fuming in anger, almost to the point of his eyes forming the Sharingan, additional chakra exhaustion be damned. Itachi did not let his emotions get the best of him and left calmly, seeing that talking to his new father would bear no fruit. Itachi dashed towards Azula's room in a quick stride, regardless of servants bowing down in his presence. He reflects on what transpired earlier and how Ozai trains Azula. At this point, Ozai reminded him somewhat of himself. He took great shame on how he manipulated Sasuke, thinking that Konoha would hail his little brother as a hero once he killed him. Unknowingly, he turned Sasuke into a weapon that would instead destroy the leaf. He tortured Sasuke using Sukuyomi, Yu Yang, and in their every encounter he manipulated his little brother as well. Only when he was revived by Yakushi Kabuto did he realize his negligence. While people may call him a successful genius, he is in his eyes, a failure. Instead of turning Sasuke into a hero, Itachi turned him into a rogue ninja. In the final moments of their last meeting, he gave Sasuke what he deserved from the start, the truth and his own choice on what to do with it. Ozai's methods, while different, fall into the same category of what he did and Itachi fears it will lead Azula to become what Sasuke became. Itachi needs to drive Azula into a path of good and love rather than hatred and suffering. This leads to another dilemma that Itachi has. 
Will he end up manipulating Azula and not giving her the free will that he purposely robbed Sasuke of? No, that is what he answered but Itachi can admit that his plan still has flaws, any plan will. Regardless, he will guide Azula towards a path of love and acceptance, and the choice of who she will be is up to Azula. His train of thought stops once he faces the doors of Azula's room. He quietly opens the door and sees Ursa tending to Azula personally with no servants around. Azula is on the bed breathing heavily with her eyes half-lidded, on her forehead is a damp cloth. On the other hand, Ursa is feeding her a bowl of kanji with a small smile on her face. Come on, Azula. Remember what the doctor told us earlier. You need to eat to gain your strength back. Azula tries to swat the spoon away from her, but it turns into her just weakly shoving it away due to her exhaustion. I don't want to, I want to train. She tried to pry herself off the bed but her strength of will alone wasn't enough and she flopped back onto the bed groaning. Training won't do you any good, Azula. Ursa places the bowl on the bedside table. You need to rest, even Zuko knows that. I need to get strong like him. I want to train like him every day. Azula, even while weak, groans passionately. Itachi couldn't see Ursa's face, but he knew she was smiling at his little sister. Azula, you will be a great firebender like your brother is but he also rests. Take a flower, for example. Water it the right amount and it will bloom beautifully. However, water it too much and it will eventually wilt. So too much a thing is bad? Azula asks and Ursa nods in response. It is. That's why you need rest for your body to grow and bloom. Ursa tucks a strand of Azula's hair to her ears. She then picked up the bowl, taking a portion of the kanji. You should eat up, Azula. With slight hesitation, Azula ate the kanji in silence without complaint. Itachi observed everything with a small smile on his face, not letting his presence be known. It seems that his efforts are bearing fruit, at least on one branch of the tree. Even if Azula is still somewhat cold to their mother, Ursa is doing her best to try and give her attention to Azula, which he is thankful for. Hopefully, in time, Azula will warm up to her. Azula's half-lidded eyes widened as he saw him. Zuzu? Ursa's head then turned to him in surprise. Itachi moved closer, his smile almost leaving his face when he got closer to Azula. It hurts seeing his sister like this, abused and battered, trained to the point of exhaustion. He vowed silently to not let this happen to her ever again, even if his discussion with Ozai was a failure. How are you feeling, Azula? What do you think? Azula groaned but he noticed that her eyes became brighter once she noticed him. I want to train, but everything is too heavy. Itachi sits on the foot of Azula's bed. That may be because of the way I've been feeding you, Azula. Ha. Ha. Very funny, Zuzu. Azula rolls her eyes but she couldn't help but smile. But I want to train, I want to become strong like you. Take mother's advice for this one, Azula. Even I take the occasional breaks from time to time. Training might do good, but as mother said, too much of a good thing can be bad for you. Itachi relaxes and slouches slightly, relaxing. You will grow strong, Azula, I can assure you of that. Ursa coughed, still holding the bowl of kanji. And for you to be strong, you need to finish this bowl. Fine, Azula suddenly grabbed the bowl and scarfed the kanji down. She finishes the bowl and takes the glass of warm water almost immediately as if the strength that was gone earlier swiftly came back. Ha! Azula points her finger at him. One day, I will become stronger than you, Zuzu. To the point that maybe you will come to me when you are weak. Azula. Ursa relents as she retrieves the bowl and places it on the bedside table. Itachi gives her an encouraging smile much to Ursa's confusion. Then I will wait for that time to come, Zula. Children. Ursa fumes and the two stare at her. That is not something you two could joke about. Including you, Zuko. To Ursa's surprise, Itachi's smile never left his face. I think it's a good attitude, mother. There will be times when I am sick and the only ones I can rely on are the ones who I care about, just like now. I think that's just her way of endearment. Azula huffed, laying back on her bed, and kept quiet. Itachi can already see the look of jealousy that she gave to both him and Ursa. Don't worry, Azula. Today I'm not going to train, I'll wait until you recover from your exhaustion. What? Think I'm not going to surpass you fast enough. Azula chuckles weakly, the energy she got earlier rapidly waning. Itachi glances up, no, I'm just doing it so you get enough rest, and so you don't accuse me of cheating, again. Cheat. Azula said quietly but Itachi still heard. 
The two snicker while Ursa just observes them. Ursa claps her hands. All right, quiet you too. Azula, you need to get some more rest. But mom. Azula groaned, dragging out, mom, can I at least play pie show with Zuzu? Doing nothing is boring. No, Azula. It will just make you sicker. Ursa sternly says as she tucks in Azula's blanket without protest. Azula not having enough energy to fight. So rest. Azula took the blanket and hid her lower face. I'm not even sleepy. Then how about this, Azula, mother? Atachi's eyes soften and his mouth gives a smile. How about I tell you a story, Azula? He then saws Azula's gloomy demeanor turn and her eyes brighten. Though you have to promise me that you will rest for the rest of the day. That'll be our game. Azula huffed and gave a smug smile. Easy, I will win this time, you can't cheat a story. I believe you will be interested in this story too, mother. Itachi places himself near the edge of the bed as he helps Ursa clean the bedside table. Once they are done, Itachi relaxes. It's called Love Amongst the Dragons. I'm sure you are familiar with it, Zula. By Agni, not that one. Azula groans. You cheat. Hey, you told me that I can't cheat a story. Itachi shrugs. I'm sure you will love it. He says hiding his grin. Itachi knows how much she hates that story. What Azula wants is a story of action and epic battles of the past. She despised sappy love stories. Despite that, Itachi began telling them the story. Ursa smiled warmly while Azula's expression is plastered with boredom. Seeing her expression, Itachi knew she'd rather do anything other than listening to a romance story. Soon enough her tiredness overtook her boredom and finally, Azula is sleeping soundly on her bed just as he was about to finish the story. Ursa then arranges for Azula to be more comfortable on her bed. Thank you for helping me with this, Zuko. Ursa speaks to him as they leave the room. I'm just doing my part, mother. We need to both do our part for Azula. Neither of us can do this alone. Itachi spoke with firmness as he closed the door gently on his way out. Doing everything alone is like bearing the weight of the entire world on your shoulders. Sooner or later the world you carry will fall. You are very well spoken, Zuko. Ursa places her hand on his shoulders. I'm glad you visited her. If you saw her yesterday, Ursa grimaced, her face filled with pain. I know, mother. Itachi sighs. I will do my best to help you today. I have nothing to do, after all. Nothing to do? Ursa mused and smiled. Would that mean you also have time to tell me about that book, Um Samadare? Do I recall correctly? You still remember that, mother. What? How could I not when it made my little prince cry? Ursa hugs him. You are going to tell me about it, or perhaps just parts of it. I'm sure you'll dislike it. Itachi snickers and smiles sadly as he looks outside at the garden. It's a story about death, betrayal, and failure. It's not for everyone. Besides, it's a lost book anyway. That story doesn't matter now, it will just be another memory. Ursa tried to speak but was cut off by Itachi. Please, mother. He could already see the slight grimace on her face. Hiding his past in the veil of a book, while genius at first, is turning into a problem for him. It's not something I'm comfortable talking about, it's my fault for reading such a book, I do not wish to regale the tales of its horror to anyone else. Ursa then sighed. I'm sorry Zuko. It's probably a good thing that book is lost, otherwise, I'd have to have the librarians hide it on the chance of Azula being curious enough to read it. A good thing to do, he replied. Though you shouldn't worry. You and I may be the only ones who know of the book's existence. It seems to be the only thing I've ever misplaced. Itachi smiled and took the used dishes back to the kitchen. A few days later, when Azula was doing much better, two wooden boxes with intricate designs and a scroll were delivered to Ursa, announced by a messenger. Seeing the note's contents, she happily brought the boxes to the garden, expecting to see her children. There they were on the grass, however, what she did not expect was for them to both be training at the same time. She quietly moved further into the garden as they synchronized their movements together. She smiled as she sat on the grass, quietly observing them while she placed the boxes gently on her lap. Ursa couldn't help but start thinking about this Samadare book and why her son was so elusive about it. He acts as if it's a trauma he's trying to hide. Zuko clearly is impacted by the story. Ursa can't help but be curious. Seeing her child cry was heartbreaking for Ursa. The last time she tried to learn more about the book and what's going on, she was shut down by her son. She's trying her best to be a good parent for him, but with Ozai and their torn marriage, it's difficult. From the palace to the academy the name Zuko is admired by all, 
and her heart swells in pride at the achievements of her son. The stoic but charming prince, excelling at everything he does, but she sees the way he constantly isolates himself. Maybe the book has something to do with it, but then again, her son has been like this since he was born. However, she set those thoughts aside and admired the serene calm in Zuko and Azula's faces, both concentrated on their training. Their firebending to her is majestic, filled with ferocity and grace, both of which could technically be found in her husband, yet his firebending would never produce the joy in Azuko's and Azula's did. Zuko punched and produced fire, planting his heels to the ground and quickly sidestepping for a kick. Azula tried to imitate the move, but fell to the ground instead, her brother picking her back up. Moments later, they were done, and immediately noticed her presence. Mother? Zuko said as he wiped the sweat off his head. Your uncle Iroh sent you two gifts from Ba Sing Se. Ursa urges the two to sit beside her but surprisingly only Azula seems excited about the gifts. Zuko's face is rather, distant, nervous even. Ursa opens up the scroll and reads it to them. It was about the current developments in Ba Sing Se. Although she knew the details were washed down, cutting out much of the horrific aspects common in war. The siege is apparently going well and the gifts were some of the captured items of Earth Kingdom higher nobility. One box even containing an item owned by an Earth Kingdom prince. Once she was done reading the letter to them, she gave them their gifts. The smile that Azula wore quickly dissolved into disappointment once she opened the box. A doll? Really? This is the gift I got? Oh shush. Ursa scolds her. You should be thankful for what your uncle is giving you. He is fighting a war out there for our sakes. And he gives me a doll while Zuzu gets. Zuko opens his box and reveals that he got a dagger, a beautiful one at that. He carefully looked at it and unsheathed the dagger. On the blade was an inscription that read, Fei Zan Bu Ku, never give up without a fight. Ursa expected her son to be elated by the gift that he received. While he was certainly not elated, he did not seem disappointed either, instead, he wore a look of reluctance. A dagger. Whoa. Let me see. Let me see. Azula huddled close to him, peering at the dagger. Here you go. Zuko gave it to her and she inspected every detail, placing the doll on the ground. Not you too Zuko, I expected better from you. Ursa scolds him but he just shrugs, infuriating her further. Then what exactly do you want from your uncle Iroh? Just for them to return safely. The reply got the attention of Ursa and warmed her heart, dissipating her prior anger. Besides, I have this. Zuko unbuttoned his pouch and revealed to her a knife that had a blade shaped like a diamond with a short grip and circular but hollow pole. A kanai. The one you had Master Piandao make for you. Ursa questions as she observes the knife. At first, she wasn't too keen on her son having such deadly weaponry on him, but he insisted, reasoning that it's just another part of his arsenal like his firebending. Why not the knife your uncle gave you? Zuko paused for a moment. It's not that I don't appreciate my gift, mother. I just feel like someone else should have a weapon other than myself. He smiled as he looked at Azula flinging the dagger in the air. And now, it's like my gift to her too. There he was being cryptic again, Ursa thought. Sometimes she thought she had her son figured out, that maybe he was just anti-social and only talks to those who he feels are worth his time. She honestly thought he would be more possessive of the gift. Maybe she is overthinking things, maybe he did give it to his sister just because he wanted to. You know that is from an Earth Kingdom prince, Zuko. She tried to reason with him. It matters not whether it is from an Earth Kingdom prince or a lowly blacksmith. There will come a time when firebending alone will not be enough to defend Azula. That's why I don't approve of father just teaching her firebending. Her face morphed into immediate concern. Oh, Zuko. She said as she gently touched his cheek. When I am around, I will never, never, ever let anyone come near you that will harm you or her. Ursa realizes what she said and it hurt her. Ozai had already exhausted Azula nights before and she was not able to stop it in any way, she wasn't even aware it was happening. Zuko's face turns into a slight grimace for a second before returning to his neutral expression. Ursa could tell that her son knew of her thoughts. Zuko sat beside her and watched Azula play with the dagger in the distance, cutting bushes and tree trunks. He took the doll and placed it on his lap. I have a bad feeling, mother. A hunch. What is it? Ursa asked scooching closer to him. Is there something wrong? Her voice was laced with concern. War never bears ripe fruit, mother. Zuko's eyes landed on the doll and gently grasped it in his hands. 
It only lays death and destruction for everyone, even those in the highest of places. It's been nearly a hundred years since the war started and if this is truly a righteous war, would it not have ended already? Would we not have already stabbed the heart of whatever is in our way and have led our people to a quick and decisive victory? If this was such a righteous war, why are there still so many unnecessary deaths? Even with the Avatar dead, there is still no conclusion to this war. This war has no true point, no, righteous, point. Zuko, if you are so against the war, why do you train so hard? Just because I detest war doesn't mean I will not fight when it comes knocking on my door, mother. Zuko threw a smirk. Azula and I should be prepared when that time no doubt comes, but until that happens, I will enjoy the peace I have. He paused. As to what my hunch is. To be honest, mother? I don't know. I just have a bad feeling. You spend what little time of peace you have constantly pushing yourself. Ursa asked him and he quietly nodded. She never knew her son was so fully against the war efforts, perhaps one of the few in the Fire Nation who was. Even she in some capacity supports it as her brother-in-law is out there. Maybe it has something to do with the book Sam Adair. Honestly, though, she was thankful that her son was honest with her, she's had enough deceit to last a lifetime. It was then that Azula returned, her face covered in sweat and her hair filled with leaves. Oh look at you, young lady. Ursa grabs a towel and wipes the sweat off her face. Azula then turned to Zuko and handed the dagger to him. Ursa could see the reluctance on Azula's part. Here you go Zuzu, you look like you need it with that sad stare. It's nothing, Zula. I just have a lot in my mind right now. Oh, and you can keep the dagger. Zuko grabbed Azula's hands and used them to grasp the dagger gently. It's yours now. There was a brief pause until Azula gasped in disbelief. No way. You're just giving this dagger to me? A priceless dagger from an Earth Kingdom prince? Well, it's now owned by a Fire Nation princess. Zuko smiled. In exchange, I get to keep this doll you want to get rid of. You're rather picky with your gifts, he smirked. Well they don't impress me and that doll looks plain. Azula rolled her eyes before trying to hide a blush of embarrassment on her face. Thank you, Zuzu. Seeing this makes Ursa's heart swell but there was also a small amount of jealousy in her heart, something she hadn't truly felt before. Ursa can't help but think that Zuko might make a better parent than her in the case of Azula. She sat quietly observing them, Azula didn't seem to even notice her presence anymore, acting like Zuko was the only person in the world. She just took a nap on Zuko's shoulder, relaxing with him in a way she didn't do with anyone else. Ursa loves Azula, she tries to be the best she can be for her, but maybe that isn't enough. Could she really be a bad parent to Azula? Ursa is a bona fide herbalist, and she prides herself on her work. Mastering each and every herb that she has in the royal garden. Tending to the plants and doing the work herself while ignoring the servants' gazes. The herb she used when she cooked kanji for Azula has a special property that can replenish energy faster while being safe for children. It has been months since they received any significant news from the siege of Ba Sing Se. At least that is what she heard from her father-in-law. Ursa was worried about her brother-in-law and his son, Iroh and Lu Ten. Iroh is pleasant company in the palace and Lu Ten is a big search brother figure for both Zuko and Azula. Still, even if Iroh is a terrifying firebender, he has a soft spot for her, maybe because of the death of his wife. Her passing isn't discussed that much in the palace, so as to not arouse the crown prince's ire. Ursa suspects he is the only one that shares Zuko's ideology, that the war needs to end, and it shall end at Ba Sing Se. Although, her son is adamant on his belief that this war will continue to eat at the Fire Nation. What Zuko said months before about a hunch that he has distressed her greatly. To her, Zuko almost feels like a mature man trapped in a child's body, but she honestly doesn't know why. Ursa could see his childlike innocence from time to time, but she can also see some deep regret that sometimes slips in when Azula and him are talking. How could a boy that is only just twelve, with his only experience of the outside being the city and Piandeo's mansion, have any deep regrets? Maybe the lost book Samadare really did impact her son in a significant way. The power of narrative isn't lost on her, as tales and legends can imprint a person with their messages and morals. That's why she is so curious about the book. Ursa asked the royal librarian if there is any record of a book called, Sam Adair, and found that the book doesn't exist. The royal library is second only to the legendary spirit library. Even an archive date would suffice, yet there was none. Could her son be lying to her? 
Such thoughts were washed away when fire sages rushed through the garden to her. Ursa could see that their faces are solemn and they are carrying a sealed scroll. Your Highness, Princess Ursa. A message from His Majesty Fire Lord Azulon. Immediately, out of pure knowledge of etiquette and instinct, Ursa kowtowed to the scroll. His Royal Majesty, Fire Lord Azulon, solemnly announces that a tragedy has struck the royal household. The Crown Prince's son, His Highness Prince Lu Ten has passed away in the valor of battle. The royal household is expected to undergo a period of mourning for two weeks. May Prince Lu Ten gain peace with Agni. Ursa's head bowed deeper to the floor, not out of reverence, but out of shock. There is no way that the wonderful man that is Lu Ten just dies, far away from the cutthroat nature of the royal court. Her thoughts were loud, denying the fact that Lu Ten passed away, worrying that this may be what Zuko was referring to weeks ago. A feeling of impending doom towards the family? The deep feeling of loss in her son's words echoing her mind aided her, and she didn't notice that her fears turned into tears. For her, for Zuko and Azula, for the family, and especially for Iroh. No parent deserves to see their offspring pass before they do. Especially only a few years after the crown princess passed away. Iroh has lost so much and even for her, this is too much. The fire sages didn't leave her with any pleasantries, which she appreciated, and left her to her own thoughts and grief. Ursa did not even hear the sound of the Ogain as her mind was full of fear. The sky is a bit gray. Itachi knows that this kind of weather does not bring good news. Weather cares not for the feelings of an individual, that is true and tested, here and anywhere, but it doesn't hurt to associate such trivialities with the human condition. Itachi is training his Shuri Kenjutsu mixing it with firebending, replicating his Katen, Hosenka Sumabeni, fire style, Phoenix Sage Flower Nail Crimson. However, unlike the technique, infusing the kanai with just firebending is not working. As he concluded, while Kai can be powerful, chakra is more potent and can be more so refined into multiple uses. He also had a thought, if Yang Release converts his chakra to Kai, can he bend other elements as well? Carefully looking around, he noticed that he had no eavesdroppers, Mai, Tai Li, and Azula included. From his readings, the traitor avatar Roku trained airbending first, However any records of the airbenders are only skewed in mysticism of their art and condemning their preemptive buildup of troops to invade the Fire Nation. No mention of their techniques are found. Waterbending and earthbending are the only ones that are documented in great detail. This is not because of a fascination for the art, but so firebenders can easily counter their strengths. Finding out if he could bend different elements would have been easy with the paper test. Even still, imbuing chakra to paper which would turn wet or go up in embers is not the same as bending. Bending is much harder, as one must discover it through technique or accident and the actual application is far different from hand signs. The first time he used bending was just by observing Ozai and Iroh and imitating their techniques using the Sharingan. Itachi imitated waterbending by going to a nearby pond. Waterbending is slow and fast, it almost has a melody in each and every move. He raised his arms slowly pouring Kai gently into his hands but nothing came out. He tried again and still the water is still. With no luck on sight, he moved to earthbending. Earthbending is fast and powerful, like a beating drum when soldiers are being led to the battlefield. The most fundamental technique according to his studies was planting the foot on the ground and having the earth rise from above. He did as the text is told and still nothing happened. Until he meets someone who can actually earthbend or waterbend. He cannot truly say whether his yang release only converts chakra to fire kai. His musings however were interrupted as he saw fire sages bowing while their hands were hidden on their robes with the leading sage carrying a crimson scroll with threaded gold. The fire sages bowed to him, Your Highness, Prince Zuko, a message from His Majesty, the great fire lord Azulon. Has his new grandfather gotten sick? Normally he would have them all summoned to the throne room to announce something important. Having the fire sages convey such a message is something unimportant to him or he is unable to do so with his words. Itachi read their faces, and as usual the faces of the fire sages harbor no feelings, but he could feel their mood is somber. Itachi then kowtowed to the scroll. His royal majesty, Fire Lord Azulon, announces that his highness, Prince Lu Ten, has died in the valor of battle. Once Itachi heard those words, he drowned out any sound that's around him. How could Lu Ten die? How could he perish in battle, shouldn't he be protected by the Fire Nation elite guard? 
This is eerily similar to how he heard of Sandame Hokage Seru Tobi Hirazan's death at the hands of Orochimaru, not letting any of his anbu get close to one of the former Sanin. But Itachi understood quickly, of course, this would inevitably happen. His world is hellbent on war after all, and he is on the side of the aggressor. Itachi didn't know how to feel about this, but he did know he is even more adamant to see an end to this war. He knows he was born on the wrong side of it. He is still loyal to Konoha and the belief in the will of fire, but those two things don't exist in this world. He soon noticed that the guards left him to his thoughts. Does he feel bad that Lu Ten suddenly died? Yes, but he harbors no brotherly or friendly feelings toward Lu Ten. Ever since he was born he only closely associated himself with his own close family. Still, memories of his best friend, Uchiha Shisui, burned in his mind. Memories of him committing suicide just to preserve the peace of the village. Itachi only fears what this death may lead to. He is already preparing Azula with techniques that are unconventional to the traditional royal family style firebending, using taijutsu, and his own training. But he knows this wasn't enough. In this new world, even with the best healers and the medicine of the Fire Nation, no one can do an eye transplant if he passes away. From the corner of his eye, Itachi saw Ursa and turned his head to her face her eyes bloodshot and her mouth quivering, deciding whether or not to try or to keep her mouth thin. Her hands then swiftly landed on his shoulders and quickly she hugged him. I should have listened to you. Itachi felt her tone quivering but he felt no dampness on his cloth. Ursa then faced him. I should have told your grandfather about your feelings last month, Zuko. If I did, Lu Ten would. Itachi just gave her a dispirited smile. Even if you could have, mother, grandfather Azulon and uncle Iroh are adamant on this siege. No one would believe my words, they believe that the spirits have long left our family a century ago. But, there is nothing we can do, mother, Itachi sighed, it has already happened, nothing can bring back Lu Ten and nothing is your fault in regards to his passing. Ursa remained silent and seemed to be contemplating, Itachi then spoke again. Thinking about, what ifs is not going to help, mother. But it doesn't mean that we have to stop mourning for his passing. All we can do now is pray to Agni for his soul. Here I was thinking that I should come here to comfort you, and yet here you are comforting me. Ursa sadly spoke. Your uncle lost so much, his wife and now his only son. Who knows what will happen next? Itachi paused for a moment. The loss of lives will only lead to more sorrow, which will yield broken and vengeful men and women. Ursa's face grimaced. Zuko. Your uncle did this for our lives, for you and your sister to live in peace. Peace, mother? Itachi coldly stated, making Ursa flinch in shock at his tone. Peace? Then what is the cost? How many more lives is the Fire Nation willing to give for this peace? For almost a hundred years no peace has been achieved. No dialogue exchanged. Only in the swaths of force did this war ever truly manifest. He paused. Is this the price of peace that uncle, father, and grandfather want to achieve? Ursa gave no response and Itachi was sure that he never gave a cold face to his mother before. Forgive me, mother. Itachi bowed to her. The tense atmosphere seems to have gotten to me. I will accept any. He didn't finish and was interrupted by his mother who hugged him very tightly. Don't. My son, I understand. She then pulled away and faced him. Just don't say this to anyone else. Don't even utter it, please. Itachi closed his eyes for a moment. That I can promise, mother. But understand that if any harm comes to our family, I will not hesitate. I will do what I must. Itachi read quietly in his room as the announcement of Lu Ten's death made the entire imperial city go into lockdown, including the royal palace. The talk with his mother still lingers in his mind. He left his mother there as they hadn't spoken after that. Clearly she was shaken by what happened. It could only be seen by those close to her. To the servants and others, she showed only an emotionless face. Still, the somber atmosphere lingered throughout the afternoon. The fire priests roamed about as he heard from a talkative servant that his grandfather, Fire Lord Azulon, locked himself in the throne room, not letting anyone come. A typical reaction seeing Lu Ten as a sociable man, almost as sociable as Shisui. Back then, Lu Ten tried to make friends with him when he visited, joining him with his uncle when he was learning advanced firebending techniques. But seeing another Shisui, his best friend, in another form was just too much. He distanced himself so as to not get attached. He was so focused on his drive to kill himself that he didn't have time to grieve for the passing of his best friend, Shisui, and his love, Izumi. 
He wondered how Azula would react to what happened. It didn't take him long to get his answer as Azula stormed into his room with a face of boredom and also, hurt. He knew that Lu Ten wasn't the cause of this. Plus, ever since that night when Azula barged into his room, she can make a face of stone or a mask of indifference easily. Gently, Itachi closed his book and faced Azula. Is something the matter, Zula? Nothing. Azula muttered while she sat on the bed and let out a huge sigh. It's not like you will pay attention to me too. Go back to your reading Zuzu. Itachi chuckled at what she said and knelt in front of her. Yet you barge into my room like that. I know that something is bothering you, Zula. Besides, how will I continue my readings if my pesky little sister is here to constantly nudge me to play with her? The corner of Azula's mouth smirked for a bit. All right. Mom just approached me earlier and asked me if everything was okay. I told her that I was okay. I don't know why, but she was surprised by me and told me that cousin Lu Ten is dead. Like what, am I a dum-dum to her? Of course I know. Those creepy old guys came into my room and basically shouted it at me. But I'm not sad about it, it's not like he hung out with us that much. I remember him pestering you, though you don't seem bothered. I was busy with studying at that time, Zula, Itachi replied. At your age, like what six years old? He nodded. I want to be able to protect myself and those who I care about. He tried to hang out with me. But I. I just couldn't. Itachi realized his face turned to a grimace that gave away too much emotion and straightened his face. Azula however caught this. She raised her eyebrows, morphing her face into concern. Um, should I be the one consoling you, Zuzu? No need. Itachi gave a fake smile that didn't convince Azula, but she left it alone. So, what did you tell mom? Well I just told her that we should put up a strong front so that when anyone looks at us, they would be inspired to not get sad, you know? Just go on with their daily life. Azula paused again, then mom scolded me as usual, told me that I should be sad and he was a great cousin to us. Like I didn't even hang out with him and now I'm supposed to feel sad. Basically telling me to just sulk in my room. And then, when I went to train, of course even the training rooms, our training rooms were closed. She sighed and let the silence linger for a moment. Am I wrong Zuzu? Is mom right? Itachi then gave a fond smile. You are right, Zula. But you are also wrong. Azula was confused but he continued. You are right that we should present a strong front so that the people of the Fire Nation can look to us for strength. However, you told her this at the wrong time. Mother is grieving, and she needs time to process Lu Ten's passing. Just imagine if I die, Azula, and someone tells you to just get it over with and you didn't have the time to fully process what happened, how would you feel? Azula frowned. I'd tell them to just get out of my face or I'll burn theirs. After realizing what she said, her face flushed in pink making Itachi snort. See? Itachi touched her shoulder and noticed that she leaned into it. When someone we care about passes away, we grieve. There is no sane human being that will not grieve for their loved ones. And when we grieve, we don't let anyone tarnish their name or let people forget what good they have done. But I didn't say anything about cousin Lu Ten. Azula argued back. I just told her to present a strong front, that's it. Itachi again gave her a nod and he gave a sigh. Also, you should know it may have been because of me that she was like that, and for that, I apologize. What did you tell her? Azula asked. I told her about a hunch that I have. A hunch? She repeated and Itachi nodded. A gut feeling that something would happen. I had it when we received those presents and I told mother about it when you were playing with your dagger. I just knew something would happen but when? Good or bad? I did not know. Itachi leaned back with his arms planted on the bed. Azula just shrugged. Could be a coincidence, Zuzu. I can tell you that Wuah, she wiggled her fingers in front of his face. Something bad is going to happen, and. Bam, of course, it would happen. Something bad has to happen eventually. Itachi chuckled. You might be right, but if there is one thing you can trust, Zula, it's your gut instinct. Anyways, getting back to what we were talking about before, what mother did was wrong. She shouldn't have told you off like that. Again Azula gave him a shrug. I'm used to it by now, I mean, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt when she still does it. Unlike you who gets praise all the time, she just scolds me. I can't even remember the last time she was just proud of me. Itachi could feel some resentment and jealousy in her tone and turned to her. But Itachi didn't reply, which she seemed to appreciate. What are you planning to do now anyway? Azula asked him. The training grounds are closed and the entire city is on lockdown. 
I can't even pester my minions to entertain me. Minions? Itachi smirked. Not friends? Well, technically they are. Azula huffed. They just have to entertain me from time to time. Can you believe that Tai Lee has so many sisters? She introduced them all to me and I can't stand it. So what are you going to do? Maybe make a new game? Itachi suggested but Azula just rolled her eyes. Oh please, as if you are not going to make it so advantageous for you. The makers of Pai Show would have your head already if they were alive. She then chuckled and Itachi just fondly smiled. It's not, he replied. It's basically a game about battle. I want to call it Shogi. Game of Generals. Azula asked with curiosity. What, is Pai Show boring for you now? Not in the slightest. Itachi spoke gently. It's a game about how you will capture an enemy leader and give them a final blow. Ending the battle outright without leaving anything for negotiation. The opposing army might have their troops destroyed or intact. It depends on how the opening moves go. You can also capture the enemy, and turn your enemy to your side to fight for you. Azula listened in silence as Itachi described the rules and each piece on a board. Shogi was a popular pastime game in the Hidden Leaf, and as far as he knew, there were no known origins as to where the game originated. The Nara clan were especially adept at the game, with the head of the clan, Nara Shikaku, a grandmaster of the game. He studied tactics with the game while playing against his old father. He planned to do the same with Azula, teaching her about tactical training, planning, and when to pick a fight. The two went to his desk as he listed the game's pieces to the ears of a curious Azula. The pawn, rook, bishop, lances, knights, the generals, and the king, stroking each character on paper. The goal of the game is to capture the enemy king and leave no escape routes. He explained as he wrote Wong. And a checkmate is made, ending the game. So it's basically what uncle failed to do, capture the earth king. Azula surmised and Itachi nodded and grimaced. Don't worry, Zuzu. One day, I will be the one capturing the earth king and presenting him to you. And you can say, a check. Um whatever for the fire nation. Oh? Itachi questioned as he chuckled for a bit. And why would he be presented to me? Well, cousin's dead. Azula deadpanned. And we have never heard of Uncle Iroh's wife before. If Uncle becomes the Fire Lord, you will be forced to become the heir to the throne one day. And leaving me with being married to an old noble who I don't even care about while being a proper lady, as mom just keeps forcing me to do. She sighed. I can see it in your eyes, Zuzu. You want to become Fire Lord one day and finally end this war. Itachi nods as he gently lets down the brush on the inkstone. You see through my metaphor, Zula. It's pretty obvious, she smirked. The way the game ends is how you want wars to end. As it should be, Itachi grimly stated. But that's not how it ends, is it? She sighs. After all, your game is just a game. Those Earth Kingdom peasants will refuse to surrender even if their king is captured. Great thing the Avatar is dead, or else those dum-dums will get ideas. With Cousin Lu Ten's passing the situation would be grim, morale would be low. Itachi sighed and closed his eyes. And if there is one thing that an overextended army needs as a hit to their morale, the siege is lost. Azula looked at him with a shocked expression but soon realized his meaning and nodded with acceptance and a thin line on her mouth. Even with a vast quantity of power, resources, the Fire Nation will have to withdraw. Itachi is quite surprised that children are still not being deployed as soldiers even during the hundreds of years of this conflict taking place. But he hasn't seen the front, and maybe the Earth Kingdom is using them just to keep his uncle from capturing the entire city. The two then discuss the mechanics of their new board game into the night and Itachi has to have it made from a skilled woodworker. Still, the war situation lingered in his mind. For almost a hundred years this new world has been in conflict and the brutality of it is muddled with propaganda. However, he knows what war is as he has already witnessed it. In time, with his training, Azula will be capable of not meeting the same fate as Lu Ten. He still wants her to live in a world of peace. Itachi knows that this is a far-fetched dream because, in the eyes of every Fire Nation citizen, even his sister, peace is only achieved with the fall of anything that isn't Fire Nation. With the Avatar dead, Itachi thought deeply about a way to end this war. All endings in his mind ended the same. Bloodshed. The end the chapter is end here now we will meet with another chapter so don't forget to subscribe our channel for more content like this.